tonight on The Boss Lady. The reality is that less than 1% of West Africans that go to Europe to play football actually make it to any of the leagues. Prospective advertiser asked me a question, how are you different from the BBC? I lost what was my unique selling point. That story ended up winning us the CNN African Journalist Award. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of The Boss Lady and I must say today it's a bit different for me because it's a special day. Being a woman in media, I'm going to be sitting down with one Yamisia Kenbobola. If you've never heard of her, you're going to hear about her today. So she's in Kenya and um, she's very big when it comes to Martyrs Media and she has this event that is coming up that's African Women in Media that um, I shall be attending gracefully but before that let's find out who Yamisia Kimabola is let's hear her story so follow me she's chilling somewhere waiting for me I'll see you there Dr. Yamisi Akimbobola is an award-winning journalist, academic, and co-founder of African Women in Media, Mother and Wife. Joint winner of the CNN African Journalist Award 2016, her media work is Africa-focused, covering stories from rape culture in Nigeria to an investigative and data story on the trafficking of young West African football hopefuls by fake agents. Yamisi holds a PhD in Media and Cultural Studies from Birmingham City University, where she is the course director for MA Global Media Management and the strategic lead for internationalization of research and the Faculty of Arts, Design and Media. Her research interest is in African feminism, journalism and media entrepreneurship. Before we get to know her better, a little history on media. Media, a word that not so long ago was used to describe a profession that described what men did. It is important to understand how women got into this playing field. It dates back to the 1970s. Beginning in the late 19th century, women began agitating for the right to work as professional journalists in North America and Europe. By many accounts, the first notable woman in political journalism was Jen Grey Swisshelm. She was one of the first female journalists of her era to report by going undercover. Women who demanded coverage from media outlets were originally categorized as misfits or insane as they were perceived as departing from their traditional domestic roles. Throughout the 1970s, media outlets and journals covering a range of feminist issues emerged around the world, including ISIS International Bulletin in Italy and the Philippines and Manushi in India. Women have been gaining influence in media both within the United States and across the world, and today we celebrate many women in this field of most importantly. Today we celebrate one who has gone out of her way to bring women in media together and give them an opportunity to network in the Africa Women in Media event, Mrs. Akinbobola Yemesi. By now I'm sure you're wondering, who is this woman? In a few, we'll let you into the world of your missy. You guessed it, not from around here. We've gone to Western Africa to bring you a lady whose passion for journalism has moved mountains, if not people and stories. So who is your missy? 
So right from when I was in a young age, we've kind of always been brought up with that entrepreneurial spirit. And growing up, we always, you know, in our parents' home, we always had CNN on TV all the time. So right from there, me and my brothers and sisters always used to talk about why doesn't Africa have its own 24 hours channel? We're going to set up our own. So that was something we've been talking about from a very young age. When I was younger, I must admit, when I was younger, I wanted to be an actress. That was like my, <laughs> that was my, so um, nice. <laughs> Do you know what? I love acting. My first degree was in creative arts and um, I did do a module in theatre arts and anytime we had plays I always got the leading role so I do love acting. Um, but then for my masters I did media production and I got interested in the art of storytelling right? and then did a PhD in media culture studies where I looked at state media relationships and media policies and things like that. So, and I did an internship with CNN and that internship with CNN kind of sealed the deal then. I, like, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and it was then that I actually set up my blog, IQ for News. And this was, this was around the time when on Facebook all you used to do was poke people. <laughs> So back in the day, <laughs> in the olden days, <laughs> in the olden days when I used to poke people on Facebook. So um, that was when I set up my blog, IQ for News. And so, I mean, what was I doing? I was just writing, I was just writing my reflections. And then I built on it, I started writing uh, my reflections on current affairs that were related to Africa. And then people started asking, oh, can we write for your blog? You know? And then, so I started, you know, having people write for my blog. I had people from America, the UK, Afri African countries and all that writing for this blog. It was nothing beautiful, <laughs> right? Like the, the look was right, quite, quite dull. I was very proud of it though then. And then, um, so when I finished my PhD, because the original idea behind my PhD was looking into setting up Africa's own 24-hour news channel. So remember, around this time, this was not existing yet, you know? Um, and so, um, and so when I finished my PhD, I registered my company. I was lucky enough to win a grant to, to an incubator program. Um, so I started IQ for News, and I ran IQ for News for four years. So I had a news website that was in really serious news, current affairs news, um, covering Africa. We had freelance journalists um, working for me all over the continent. Had an amazing journalist in Kenya called Job Apollo. So he was covering um, Kenya for us. Um, so I had journalists working from all over the continent. And that ran profitably for four years. So it was profitable, but it was not profitable enough for me to innovate. And that was the missing thing for me. So we could either continue to just do the same thing and make the same amount of money and recruit the same amount of journalists and just be producing the same thing. But then I got to a point where a prospective advertiser asked me a question, how are you different from the BBC? And it got me stuck because I'm like, oh God, yeah, that's so true. I've lost what was my unique selling point because now I was just following the news cycle and doing the newsy thing and all that. And there was no innovation. I was, I was not really having impact. And that for me was not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to just do something for the sake of doing it. I wanted to have impact. I wanted to contribute somehow. You know, Obama said, make yourself useful, right? <laughs> so. 2014, so this is, I started 2010, this is 2014 now, so I decided to put IQ for News on pause. Not to stop it, but to put it on pause while I reflected on, you know, what I've done over the last four years. And in that time, because since finishing my PhD, I'd not really done much academia, though I was teaching here and there um, once in a while, but I'd not really kind of done any publications and stuff. So I took that year to do a couple of publications um, and to also reflect on what we've done. And also by 2015 now, I applied for a grant, a journalism grant, to produce an investigative story. So it was a story around player trafficking, so the trafficking of West African um, football hopefuls by fake agents, right, who promised them a lucrative life as a famous footballer. And reality is that less than 1% of West Africans that go to Europe to play football actually make it to any of the leagues, you know, one, less than 1%. So we did this investigative story it was over several months. And um, that story ended up winning us the CNN African Journalist Award. <laughs> so it was, just, it was just so weird that at the point where I was now trying to think about how to wrap up IQ for News and do something else, this then happened. And that's the importance of being ready for the opportunity, right? Because that 
investigative story, that investigative story, the success of it, the award, didn't just come out of nowhere. It came out of years of experience of working with freelancers, of writing bids, of doing all those things. So when the opportunity came, and bear in mind, I remember the day I submitted the application, I had a baby that morning. <laughs> what? Yeah, I saw my baby was just barely six weeks old when I started this story. You know, again, importance of having a supportive structure because my husband was there to, you know, help with the baby and stuff, you know. I remember when we did our, um, so one of the news gathering techniques we used was, um, was a hackathon, a hack day. So we had technologists, we had researchers and people would speak in different languages from different organisations. We had um, open corporates there, the BBC and all that. So we did like a hack day to kind of gather, do some more research around the story. And so I think my daughter was like two months or so just under two months old. She was, I was still exclusively breastfeeding as I did with all my kids. And so the challenge was now, okay, what do I do with the baby? <laughs> you understand? Then I, what I should have done is taking her with me. That's what I should have done, right? Okay, that's what I should have done. But I didn't think about it then. You know, I, I was still, it was, I was still thinking it was, wouldn't be appropriate to bring a baby to that environment. So my husband said, "Well, why don't you go? Every couple of hours, I bring the baby to you. You breastfeed. <laughs> you know, and she's still that. She's still at that age where all she does is eat, sleep, poop. <laughs> you know, so." So that's what we did. So literally every couple of hours, me and my husband will meet at the central point, I'll breastfeed, he'll take her to grandma's or to the park or something, I'll go back, do my work, two hours later, I drive again, you know. And that's what we did for a whole day. This was like eight till six, a whole day that we did this. You know, the baby was fine because she was just resting, she was enjoying herself, she was getting to go to the park and stuff. So, you know, she didn't know any different because she still got mom's boobs when she wanted it, you know. So, um, so yeah, so we did this story and, uh, and, you know, all of that journey, all of those things that I had to go through doing this story, the, the kind of, you know, having to have the baby while I'm, I mean, imagine having the baby on your back while you're doing an audio interview on the phone and things like that, you understand? And just that journey made, it, made winning that award even much more worthwhile. Yes, the award was indeed for sacrifice, hard work and persistence. Yamesi matured from just being a journalist to an entrepreneur. We go on a short commercial break and when we come back, we take a look at Africa Women in Media and how it came about.